The Bible is full of place names and it isn't always easy to, when you're reading the scripture, to find out where certain things took place. You find that somebody moved from this place to that place. And although it's a good idea always to have an atlas and check up on the atlas to see where you are, it uh, still doesn't give you the, the atmosphere of the place. The whole point of this video is to give you that atmosphere, to um, show not only where the places are, because we should be showing you on a map, but also the places themselves as they are today, looking at them and imagining what they were in many, many years before, in their biblical times. So we propose to go through Israel as far as we can, in the time that we have available, to show you a large number of biblical sites so that they can bring back memories, vivid memories, of the events which took place there so very many years ago. I hope you're going to enjoy the video and I hope you're going to be able to share my enthusiasm for these things and that they'll help you in your studies of the scriptures. We've called this video from Dan to Beersheba because it's a scriptural definition of the whole land of Israel and because although the land goes further south than that, we only had time to travel from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. So before going north to Dan, we've got to start where the children of Israel did, on the banks of the River Jordan. Not very easy these days to get close to the Jordan. We tried twice, once at the Adam Bridge, which was closed and guarded, and once a bit further south, where we found the area heavily mined and closed off by barbed wire. However, we were able to get this picture of the river just before it entered the northern end of the Sea of Galilee, a narrow, fast-flowing stream fed by springs from Mount Hermon. When the river emerges from the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee, it's much calmer, and it twists and turns its way southward past the ancient city of Adam until it's parallel to Jericho. Now there are fords there, and this is the place where the waters went back to Adam, and Israel passed over dry shod, as the priest bearing the ark stood in the river bed. And the people passed over right against Jericho, and the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground, until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. On the other side, the people gathered in the plains of Jericho, at a place called Gilgal. And at that site today are the ruins of a huge palace built by the Caliph Hisham ibn Abdel Malik in the 8th century AD. It took him 19 years to build it, and it lasted only four years before being destroyed by an earthquake. Our main interest here is not, of course, the Hisham Palace, but the fact that it's supposed to be one of the sites which could be Gilgal. It certainly will be in this area because the Jordan is way uh, over ahead of me, and behind me is the hill of Jericho, and it was in this area where the Israelites camped after they had crossed over the Jordan in that magnificent time when the waters receded back to Adam, the priests stood in the water holding the ark, and the Israelites all came over. And they came here to Gilgal, and they were circumcised, showing the faith which uh, they had in their God. The local inhabitants uh, did not come to attack them because they had a reputation which had gone before them. And from here they went ahead and took Jericho. Gilgal means rolling, and the place where Israel rolled on their Creator, rolled on their God, and showed their faith, which unfortunately, many times in the future, they failed to do. Joshua now had to consider the dangers of remaining at Gilgal. Only a few miles away was a powerful, fortified city inhabited by Canaanites. It was called Jericho. In addition to its strategic position, Jericho had an abundant water supply. It was an oasis in the desert plain, fed by springs which flowed strongly even in the summer when the rivers were dry. Now these springs are quite remarkable.
This one is flowing with tremendous force through the desert. There's no water in the bodies this summer. The temperature is over 40 degrees. And this spring is coming from a barren mountain on the eastern side of the Judean hills. As a matter of interest, at the foot of this hill, close to that Bedouin camp, is an ancient tell which the Arabs call Sunna'a. It's the town which provided Nehemiah with labourers to rebuild the fish gate in the wall of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 3, verse 3. But the fish gate did the sons of ha Sana'a build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. You can see by the palm trees that the Bedouin have tapped into the spring here. The water is cool and sweet. We filled up our water containers here. And it flows like this all the year round in country which is otherwise totally dry and barren. Just a few twisted trees and very sparse vegetation. Rather like the deserts in Australia. Now imagine the time when Moses was commanded to speak to the rock in the wilderness. And you could see how easily the water supplied by God could have been sufficient for tens of thousands of cattle and the two million people in the desert of Sinai. This man-made aqueduct carries the water for over 20 miles to Jericho. The school of the prophets worked and studied nearby here in the time of Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And this is at the traditional site of the bitter spring healed by the prophet Elisha by pouring salt into it. You can find that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 20. Today it's covered by palm trees and concrete to protect the water, which even now forms part of the town's supply. This camel waiting for tourists is outside the site of the new multi-million dollar Palestinian casino built with overseas aid money. What a travesty! And what an insult to the deity, overlooking the site where the army of Joshua took the city of Jericho and razed it to the ground. We'll go now to that historic site. This is Jericho, the city of palm trees, the first city in the land of Canaan to fall to Israel. And it fell through three ingredients. Faith, courage, and obedience. Jericho must have seemed a formidable city as the people saw its walls and the towering mountain behind it. I wonder what would be in their minds as they marched silently around it day after day with the priests blowing the trumpets. A city of Canaanites with abominable practices, straightly shut up, as the scripture says, because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. It was a city ripe for destruction. And on the seventh day its end came, and the people compassed the city seven times. Joshua chapter 6, verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! For the Lord hath given you the city. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. That was two thousand years before the time of Jesus Christ. Extensive scientific excavations have taken place here over the years, and various theories have been put forward as to how the walls collapsed. Personally, I find no problem in believing the clear, concise history in the book of Joshua. Looking at the scene, I am conscious of the courage of three people, the two unnamed spies sent out by Joshua and the woman Rahab who protected them. She told them to flee to the mountain, and here is that forbidding mountain where they hid until the Canaanites gave up the chase. They were young men, it says in chapter 6, verse 23, and they had the honour of rescuing Rahab and all her family, the only living beings who survived the judgment of God on an evil city. As we look at the remains of it after 4,000 years, we can thank the archaeologists for the work they've done. 
But we should keep in mind that the city fell because Joshua carried out the instructions of his God and the people obeyed their leader with faith and courage. When Israel obeyed their God, they were blessed. But when they disobeyed him, there was always trouble. On this occasion, trouble was not long in coming. Having taken Jericho and established a foothold, Joshua had to advance into the hill country to occupy strategic areas before spreading out to take the rest of the land. There were two immediate targets, the fortress town of Ai and the city of Bethel. Joshua sent spies out to assess the situation at Ai, and he made the mistake of accepting their assessment without consulting God for guidance. The spies told him that the population of the city was very small, and only a small force would be needed to take it, and Joshua sent out only 3,000 men. The ascent to Ai was not easy. The hills were barren and steep, the sun was hot, and water was always a problem. Joshua's soldiers approached the city through a wadi, which led to it. In those days the valley was more woody than it is now. The word Ai means ruin, and one Israeli general, Kaim Herzog, thinks that it was already a ruin when Joshua attacked it. It had been there for at least 1,400 years. Abraham and Jacob both knew it years ago. And Herzog writes in a book called Battles of the Bible that the men of Bethel had heard of the destruction of Jericho and were fearful for their own city. So they sent an advance guard to the nearby fortress town of Ai, which had a commanding view of the valley. Once Joshua's small force was observed marching towards Ai, reinforcements were hurriedly sent from Bethel. The army of Israel was taken by surprise and routed very quickly. Well, whether Herzog's theory is correct, or not, the Bible confirms the defeat of Israel by forces from Ai. So they went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted, and became as water. Joshua had learned a lesson. But there was still another reason for the defeat at Ai, and this was soon divinely revealed to Joshua. Close to Gilgal is the valley of Achor, and this wadi runs through it. It was in this area that Achan sinned by coveting a Babylonish garment, two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold. He was brought before Joshua, and in this valley he and all his family were stoned and burnt with all their possessions. A dreadful example to Israel in the wilderness. Before leaving this area, we must take a 2,000-year leap forward and visit the site of New Testament Jericho, which is quite a different city from the one destroyed by Joshua. Joshua had been told by God to pronounce a curse on anyone who would rebuild the city, Joshua 6.26. And this was realized when Hiel rebuilt it in the days of Ahab, first of Kings, 1634, losing two of his sons in the process. It remained a prominent city for many years. The New Testament Jericho was a flourishing city, some miles from the original site, and it was mainly built by Herod the Great, who used it as his winter capital. It was visited by Jesus, and in his era it was a very elegant place, featuring pools, an amphitheatre, and a hippodrome, in other words, a racetrack. Herod always built a racetrack close to his palace so that he could watch the horse racing. Many of the priests lived here when they were not required to work at the temple, and this was a fact indicated by the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is a Jericho that very few people know about because it's the Jericho of the New Testament and not of the Old. Now, we've had a good look this morning at the excavations of the time when Jericho was taken by Joshua. But here is the Jericho of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where he taught and walked. And over that wadi which is below us are excavations of the site where the Lord Jesus Christ would have been. And he walked along a road which uh, we can't quite see from here, but it's past that Bedouin uh, Campment there, and he would have met the two blind beggars as he walked out of Jerusalem. And this is where he spent 
This would be the last time that he was in Jericho before his death. It was the place from which he steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem. This is the road winding northwards to Jerusalem where Jesus would have met and cured the two blind beggars and also the blind man Bartimaeus. He just left Jericho, of course, not Jerusalem, as I said with the slip of the tongue. But to the west was the road to Ai through the rugged hills, and we pick up the story of Joshua once again. After the tragic affair in the Valley of Achor, Joshua advanced once again to the hill country with the entire army of Israel. He realized that the Canaanites must not be allowed to regain confidence after their initial defeat of his troops. A decisive attack on Ai had to be made quickly. On the top of that hill to the right is an Arab town called Deir Dibwan, and behind it is the city of Ai. The dark line diagonally across the screen is the valley traversed by Joshua's army. The site of Ai is not easy to find today but after passing through Deir Dibwan, it suddenly comes into view. A hot day, a pile of ruins, complete silence and desolation, and the scene of a brilliantly fought battle by Israel's first great general. An eerie place, just the sound of the wind, where one almost expects to hear ghostly sounds of the battle. These are the ruins of the city of Ai, which was finally taken by Joshua after the first disastrous attempt due to the sin of Achan. A city powerfully uh, in a powerful position on the top of a hill, one wonders how it was that Israel was so confident of taking it. But this is the site of the ancient city of Ai. Having recently taken Jericho so easily, and seeing only a small population at Ai, the spies had been confident of taking it quickly with a small force. But the town had been built as a fortress, and even with his full army, Joshua had to lay his plans carefully. He moved quickly. With the angels of God to guide him, he devised a brilliant strategy. Taking advantage of the wooded slopes, which were a feature in those days, he stayed out of sight until nightfall, and then he moved his army to the north of the town with the valley between it and the base of the town. Under cover of darkness, he sent an ambush force of 30,000 men down the Wadi Valley, and they assembled in a fold of the hills to the west of the city, invisible to the forces of Ai, when the sun rose the following morning. Sometime later, he sent a blocking force of 5,000 men a little further westward to prevent more reinforcements arriving from Beth Ael. The trap was set, and Joshua waited for the sun. From here, we're looking westward to the fold in the hills which hid the ambush force of 30,000 men. Moving now towards the north, this is where Joshua's army made its dummy attack which drew the forces of Ai out of the city. And here is the valley through which Joshua's army turned and fled once more enticing the defending army to charge them as before. At exactly the right moment, when all the enemy had left the city to attack them, Joshua stood on a hill, probably this one, and waved his spear, glinting in the sun, and from behind the tail of Ai came the ambush, rushing into the remnants of the city and setting it ablaze. This time, the angels of God fought for Israel, and they routed the enemy as the ambush force took them in the rear. Looking back, they saw the fortress ablaze, and the battle was won. The forces of Ai were caught in a pincer movement and were destroyed, and the city reverted once again to a ruin, exemplifying its name. Joshua 8.28 And Joshua burnt Ai, and made it an heap forever, even a desolation unto this day. On the road map today, is its modern name, Kurva Tel Ha'ai, Ruin of the Heap of Ai. Not far away to the east and slightly to the north is a modern Jewish settlement called Beit El. The actual site or tell of the biblical Beth El is almost a kilometer to the south 
and is almost obscured today by an Arab town called Beit Inn, which encroaches on it. The tale is quite extensive, but we were unable to examine it because the local inhabitants thought we were Israelis from Beit El and made it obvious we were not welcome. And this was a great shame because of its long history. It was here that Abram pastured his flocks on arrival from Haran. Lot was with him. Jacob came here. It was part of Samuel's judging circuit. It was the place where Jeroboam ordered the worship of one of the golden calves. Elijah and Elisha came here, and the prophet Amos thundered against it. But close to it, between Bethel and Ai, is an even more significant site. Abram the Hebrew camped here with his nephew Lot. Genesis 12, verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. We find it deserted. This is looking north. Ai is to the right, to the east, and Bethel to the left on the west. Some years later, Jacob came here on his way to Padam Aram to seek a wife, Genesis 28, 11. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. During the night, the promises to Abraham were repeated to him. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. Even today it's a desolate place, and it remains just as it was in the time when the book of Genesis was written, over 4,000 years ago.